Good evening, everyone, and welcome to, welcome to Sky Observer's Hangout. So my name is Adriana, and I am the astronomy educator at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. And my name is Michelle, and I'm the director of public observing at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. And uh, joining me behind me is uh, my two cats who have decided that now is a perfect time to play with a cardboard box. So I'm hoping all of you have a fantastic time tonight. Um, Adriana, do you want to introduce our uh, two friends who are joining us as well? Yes, so we've got some friends behind the scenes tonight. Uh, we've got our YouTube chat moderator is Colleen, and also in the chat we have our astronomer friend, Lucianne. So if you see a name with a blue wrench, little blue wrench next to it in the chat, that's Lucianne, and they are helping answer your questions and talk to you in the chat. Excellent. Well, we are so glad to have you with us. Sky Observer's Hangout is a place for all of us to gather together and completely nerd out about the sky. And our goal is to give you practical tips, things to look for in the sky we all share. And if you want to just watch, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we also would love to see your questions and observations in the chat. Absolutely. Please talk to us. So... Uh, to get the chat started, let us know where you are tuning in from. And I noticed we've already had some people doing that, so we're going to keep an eye on there, and Adriana's going to pick out a few people in just a second to say hello to. Now, while the Adler's doors must remain closed for a while, uh, we're doing our best to keep our virtual doors open uh, by creating and sharing some out-of-this-world content for you. And if you wouldn't mind, there will be a link that appears in the chat periodically that will um, allow you to you know, donate to the other, pay what you think uh, is comfortable for you to contribute to our programming. We thank you so much for allowing us to keep sharing our universe with you. Again, while we're closed, but we're happy to be with you wherever you are right now. Absolutely. And you can help us get a little bit more visibility for our shows by hitting subscribe for the Adler Planetarium's YouTube channel. So yep. if you like us, give us a thumbs up too. Yeah, that should I appear see. right below us in the uh, in the YouTube. So just hit subscribe if you haven't already. Yeah, so who do we have I'm tonight, Adriana? Seeing... Who do you want to who do you want to pick out? We've got lots of friends. We've got friends from Colorado. Hello. We've got Jose from Melrose Park. Hello again. I remember you. Uh, Jose, welcome back. Awesome. We've got friends from Kenosha. It's neat to see people from close by and from all kinds of places. Crete. I don't even know where that is. But we're glad oh, Crete, you're here. Uh, uh, South Suburbs. So awesome. Yeah. Yep. So excellent. Uh, South Suburbs of Chicago. For those of you not in the Chicagoland area, um, well, we hope that you are uh, doing well where you are. We hope the skies are clear where you are. Um, so tonight we are going to focus our attention on the red planet Mars. We are going to jump right into this show. First, we will talk about how you can find Mars in the sky in October of 2020, and then we'll cover why Mars is bright in our sky right now. We'll do all that pretty briefly. Then we will connect live with two friends from uh, the Naperville Astronomical Association, and they are in Chicago suburbs. They have their telescopes trained on the sky right now. So stick with us. Um, it is clear where they are. It is clear where we are. And so we are going to show you live telescope views uh, just a little bit later in the show. We hope you enjoy it. But we want to teach you a little bit uh, before we get there. So summer nights have transitioned to fall skies. We are enjoying all that um, as we speak. So we hope the weather is great where you are. So Adriana, what's up with what's going on? What are we doing? Why are we talking about Mars tonight? That is a great question. Uh, we are talking about Mars because of opposition. Uh, but I have a question for you first. Hmm. Uh, and that is, opposition. have you seen Mars in the night sky? I have. I'm hoping our audience has too. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Awesome. What did it look like? Um, when I saw it, it was bright and orange. So um, not really twinkling, just uh, a really vivid orange color. Yeah. When were you looking? Most recently, I saw it um, about 20 minutes ago when I when I looked outside, and then I've seen it over the last few weeks. Prior to that, I, it was it was maybe the midsummer of 2018. That's that's pretty much when I the last few times that I've seen it. 
Awesome. Oh, I already see people also telling us in the chat if they've seen it. Uh, Jeff says that he sees it now, bright and orange. Yes, very good. Excellent. So if you haven't already, let us know in the chat if you have seen Mars before. Oh, and we've got people here saying, do we need a telescope? King T is correct. You do not need a telescope to see Mars. You can see it with just your eyes. It's pretty bright. Absolutely. And it doesn't matter where you are, city, suburbs, country, no one place is great to see Mars right now. Planets are awesome no matter where they are. So keep it coming in the chat. Let us know uh, where are you and can you see Mars in the sky right now? And if you don't know where to look, we're going to let you know. Now, if you're watching this show as we're presenting it live on October 6, 2020, and you are in the central time zone in the U.S. or east of it, and it's dark out where you are, um, Mars should be visible for you. Um, so I am going to, in just a second, I'm going to share a resource that we can use um, to be able to find Mars in the sky. Um, so I'm going to go to a resource called Stellarium. Um, if you were with us last week, um, you saw us use Stellarium. And so this is an online resource that can uh, show us where things are in the sky. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a second. And there it is. All right. OK. Great. So there we got it. All right, so this is set up for where I am, which is in the western suburbs of Chicago. This is set up for now. So on the lower right-hand corner of the screen, it says 2005. It's on a 24-hour clock, so 2005 is 8.05 p.m. And uh, currently, Stellarium is facing north, but we are going to turn and face east. Um, this is Stellarium.org. They have a, an online version, completely free. So this is live in the online version right now. You can go there and see this for yourself and look they've got a very bright orange circle <laughs> to represent Mars and it is the brightest thing out there right now right so um, there's brightest thing in that direction there's really nothing for it to compete with uh, we can also uh, point out constellations it's in the constellation of Pisces but there really aren't any Pisces stars that are that are going to be brighter um, than the planet Mars um, so we've got uh, also, if I turn to the south, we have Jupiter and Saturn. If you are outside right now, turn to the south. So if you're facing east, go 90 degrees. So uh, 90 degrees to your right, and you will uh, look about halfway up in the sky, and you should see two bright dots. The brighter one is Jupiter. The slightly dimmer one to the left is Saturn. We're going to show you both of those. Actually, we're going to show you all three, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, through constellations in just a little bit. Um, so yeah, we've got some cool stuff to see. And there are other things you can add um, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Stellarium website, but I wanted to show you the, the sky map for tonight. And we're not really focusing on constellations tonight. We did that last week with the fall sky, um, but tonight is all about those planets. And then the moon is gonna rise um, a little bit later. I just wanna point out one quick thing. I'm gonna go back to Mars. I'm gonna go back to my timer here and we're gonna jump forward by an hour and then another hour, and then another hour, and you can see Mars is gonna get higher in the sky, so it'll be even easier to see as we yeah. go on. Yeah. That's so, super helpful for me because I have a bunch of buildings in the way, so I've gotta wait until it's a little bit higher in the sky. There you go. And I'm gonna go backward just a bit. We're gonna go back to about 9 p.m., but I'm gonna step forward by days. And you can see each day that I go forward, Mars is going to be slightly higher in the sky each day. So it's going to be an even better visibility as term, in terms of how high it is um, over the next several days. And then uh, right around the, let's see, there we go, right around the 28th, 29th, we're going to get the moon and Mars really close to each other. So that'll be a fun sight to see in the sky. So there you go. Oh, Some stuff to friends. look forward to. Yeah. All right. And I'm gonna All right, so I did want to touch on one question related to uh, what Michelle was talking about. Somebody asked, can we see it from the lakefront or facing away from the lakefront? Um, from the lakefront, look towards the east, so you will be able to see it. Now, from the lakefront, face the water. Yes. If you're talking Lake <laughs> Michigan, if you're talking Lake Michigan and you're on the Chicago side of the lake, Face That's a the great water. Point. We don't know yes. exactly what like people are talking about. Correct. If you are on Lake Michigan, Chicago. you're on the Michigan side. 
face the land. <laughs> so if you're in Indiana, turn to the right. Um, so yeah, it'll depend on where exactly you are around. If you're in the Upper Peninsula, turn to the left. Um, so there you go. All right, we got we got all of Lake Michigan covered. So all right, <laughs> go ahead, Adriana. Uh, so earlier, Michelle was talking about how for the past few months, she hadn't paid a ton of attention um, to Mars, except for a couple of years ago. So there's a good reason for this. And I touched on it a little bit earlier, but we're going to dig more into it. It is called opposition. I'm sorry, I did jazz hands. Okay, <laughs> so opposition is the term that astronomers use to describe when the sun is on the opposite side of the sky as another object. So what you would see from Earth is that the sun goes down um, in the western part of the sky, and then the other object that's at opposition would come up in the opposite part of the sky. So for us, since we're looking at Mars, that is um, rising in the east, just like we were talking about. Opposition for Mars is coming up on October 13th. So that is why we are doing this super exciting episode right now. Um, we are just very excited about opposition. Exactly. Now, observers care about opposition for a variety of reasons, but the most significant is visibility. Um, Mars is small, despite those stupid emails that we saw every single year that apparently seem to make their way around to make it sound like Mars will be as big as the full moon in the sky. Well, that will never happen. Um, Mars is small. It is about half the size of Earth. And so when it's far away, the features on the surface are harder to see through your telescope. Since the invention of the telescope, opposition specifically has given those telescope user users the best chance to see and study Mars from Earth. And we have quite quite a few examples of these opposition drawings and writings in the Adler Planetarium's world famous collection. We're going to show you one in just a second. Awesome. There it is. There it is. So a little bit of history for you. Beginning in 1877, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli, whose Good name job. I can pronounce because I practiced, uh, viewed Mars during opposition. And he produced several maps of the planet. So on the Mars map, Schiaparelli used the term canali to refer to various straight line features. Now, the word canali means channels, but it was also translated by some as canals, suggesting something that was built on purpose instead of like a naturally occurring feature. So Earth is making its run around in the solar system. It's coming around to join Mars in the solar system. Now in Schiaparelli's drawings, you can see those darker shaded areas in, in this in this drawing you can see it near the top of the of the drawing as well as a whiter top. Uh, the left hand drawing, you can see a, a white top and a white bottom there. And uh, the picture on the right, um, there we go. Whoops, I'm going to go back. Um, so the there it is. The picture on the right is one that our colleague Nick took just a few days ago. Um, and the picture on the left is Schiaparelli's drawing. So you can see uh, we've got what Schiaparelli drew through his telescope and what an actual picture of Mars looks like. And you got to admit, this picture is stunning. Our, our, our friend Nick did a great job with this one. Um, but the darker areas in Schiaparelli's drawing, those are areas of volcanic darker rock. The, the reddish areas are areas that are covered by dust. And you got that white polar cap, that ice cap. Mars has ice caps, just like uh, similar to how Earth does. Um, and sometimes it's the northern polar cap that faces us. And sometimes it's the southern polar cap. Um, in this particular case, Nick is showing us the southern polar cap in this picture. And one thing we also have to remember from Schiaparelli's drawings he was viewing them through a telescope. Telescopes flip the image upside down. And so this image is upside down. You'll see south is at the top and north is at the bottom of Schiaparelli's drawing. So when we, whoops, when we, we are going backwards for some reason, hang on. <laughs> I'm going, I am experiencing a technical difficulty. My PowerPoint was going nuts for a second. Give me just a second. I'm gonna get you back to Schiaparelli's drawing here. I'm gonna start happens. that over again because every time I'm clicking on something, it's actually going forward. Give me just a sec, hang in there, talk amongst yourselves. I do have a question in the Please. chat if you want to um, Go for that. it. So yeah. uh, two questions about the volcanoes on Mars. How yes. long ago 
Were they active and were they lava flow, ash spewing, or both? Ooh, that's a fun Ooh, question. That's a great question. I think I know who and who asked that question too. I believe that was Ron Masters. Um, and so Ron, that's a great question. Um, the volcanoes on Mars are, uh, we're, we're not quite sure when they stopped erupting. They may not have stopped erupting. We have not seen an active eruption um, on Mars, but uh, we expect that they were shield volcanoes. These are volcanoes that, that erupted with the, with the magma coming out in one spot, and those volcanoes just got taller and taller and taller. So think Kilauea uh, in Hawaii. Think that kind of volcano. Uh, but as for explosive or ash spewing and that sort of thing, not really sure. Maybe Lucianne can help us answer that question as well. Uh, shed some light on, um, uh, on, the, on the volcanoes, the types of volcanoes. But the best example we have is to compare them to on Earth is, um, uh, is those, uh, the shield volcanoes that, that we have that erupt in one spot, essentially. All right, so I've got Schiaparelli's drawing, and we have pictures that both Nick and I took uh, recently of Mars. And here we go. Here we've got Schiaparelli's drawing and Nick's picture. And then, oh, and for whatever reason, the, the image where I flipped it is not showing up. But that's OK. You get the idea. You can flip this around mentally for yourselves. Um, but we have to do that because telescopes flip our images upside down. So anyway, Adriana, any, anything else before we go on? Uh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions <gasps> that, right. uh, that you want to get to? Uh, I think down here. Oh, OK. Nope, we already, we've already got it covered in you the chat. You got it. All right. Good job, everybody. Great questions. OK, so um, when opposition happens every 26 months, so Earth runs around the solar system, catches up to Mars, we call that opposition. Now. When the two planets are, are close to each other, meaning when they are physically at their closest position, we call that close approach. And um, Earth's orbit is fairly circular. Mars's orbit is more oval shaped. And so what happens is um, Mars's orbit is also a little bit tilted to Earth's orbit. And when you, when you put all that together, what you get is sometimes the close point that these two planets are can be as little as about 35 million miles. They could be as far apart at that close point as about 62 million miles. So it makes quite a big difference in the sky as to how bright we actually see Mars. Um, so this close approach that's happening, um, this is actually today, October 6th. And so we've got a quick little drawing that I can show you of close approach, there it is. So the, the right now, the two planets are about 38, 38 and a half million miles away. Right? So close. So close, exactly. Now opposition and close approach are not exactly, they, they are at exactly the same time. They can be up to about eight days apart. They can be 10 minutes apart. Um, but in this case, we've got close approach today and opposition is the 13th. So that's where we're gonna be back on the 13th um, to celebrate opposition, all right. Awesome. So we've talked about how it's 38 million miles apart. The planets will be progressively further apart at opposition and close approach for the next seven years, meaning Mars will be smaller and smaller through our telescopes each time we come around to catch up with it. The next close approach, similar to the one in October 2020, will be in September 2035. So it's going to be a minute um, during most of the time between. If you're not super interested in looking at Mars, we'll forgive it. It's not going to be as exciting. It's yeah. still cool, but you know. It won't be that bright in the sky. It's not the same. All right. <laughs> so we hope that you guys are enjoying this bit of science about opposition and close approach. Let us know if you have any questions in the chat. Um, and if you don't know already, Lucianne, our astronomer friend, is in the chat with a little blue wrench uh, next to their name. So go ahead and ask your questions if you've got them. Yep, if you see someone answering questions with a little blue wrench, that is Lucianne. Now, if you are interested in seeing more of the Adler Planetarium's amazing historical collection, um, check out our Google Arts and Culture online exhibit. It is titled A Martian Sensation, colon, Maps, Delusion, and the Mars Canals. You gotta love that title. We will put a link to that 
in the YouTube chat. And to learn even more about observing Mars and how planets look in our night sky, be sure to watch the September 30th and October 7th episodes of Sky Watch Weekly, again with our pal Nick, who took that amazing picture of Mars. You can find it on this very same YouTube channel. All right, the moment you all have been waiting for, we're going to bring in our friends. Um, we're going to go live to a couple of observatories here in the suburban Chicago area. Um, so they're going to unmute themselves in just a second. And we are going to see at least one of them <laughs> in just a sec. Um, so we have Drew Carhart from the Naperville Astronomical Association. And we have Commander Frank Clicar, also from the Naperville Astronomical Association, and they have offered to show us images through their telescopes from their observatories. So, Drew, you are going to go first, and we know we can hear you, um, but okay. Drew's keeping his camera off because he's got, uh, he wants to make sure he's got a good enough signal to uh, show us pictures through the telescope. So, Drew, how you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, I'm in the uh... Sky Observers Hangout uh, out in Naperville and uh, belongs to the Suburban Astronomy Club out here, the Naperville Astronomical Association. And we're really happy to be helping to support Mars Night. And uh, hello to everybody out there. And uh, I think if I click this button, I am, I'll see if I can center this a little bit. Uh, I am sharing a live view of Mars through our this is our, we have two observatories out here. One of them is actually built to do video astronomy, but Mars is too low in the sky to capture through that uh, telescope. I'm in our uh, visual observatory. I uh, have the camera on a 16 inch reflecting telescope. And boy, that doesn't look too exciting, does it? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's um, a reason. There's a reason. Yeah, though, there's a so very good yeah. reason. So uh, the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere is actually pretty thin. And when you look straight up, and you turn your head all the way back or lie back and look straight up overhead, you're really not looking through very much air. But even there, there's heat waves that smear the light. Um, it's the same effect that when you look over a, like a hot road in the summertime and see heat waves going, there's always uh, bubbles of cold air sinking and uh, streams of hot air rising and those temperature changes smear the light. But when we look down by the horizon, we're looking through many more times air. So uh, oftentimes through a telescope, if you have a telescope, little or big, you might notice sometimes you go out to look at the moon or something that has details on it like the planets, and it looks like it's underwater. And that's just the turbulence in the atmosphere smearing the incoming light. It's really unfortunate that light came all the way here from Mars and looked really great till it just got to the Earth's atmosphere. And that last few thousand feet, it gets kind of smeared out like this. But uh, so this again is the live view right now of Mars. You can see a tiny bit of detail on it um, up at the, I think actually I can put my hand on the screen here. Um, there it is, up yep. The up here is a polar cap. So you might see a little bit of white coming going there. And then there's some, some dark, that those dark, subtle dark markings going across the planet like you saw in the photos of Mars. Mars is always subtle. When you see pictures with a lot of contrast, those are kind of exaggerated. Uh, when you, do, you take photographs, you do things to increase the contrast. So to your eye, a lot of coloration is subtle. And uh, normally I would say tonight, if I wanted to look at Mars, I'd be out at one in the morning when Mars is going to be up actually pretty high and I'd be looking through much less air. But uh, we're live, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's cool. So, so Drew, Mars is the god of war and blood yep. and fire and all that mm -hmm. stuff. But I'm seeing this rather subtle, uh, rusty color. So, yeah. are you showing? Are you showing us the true color of Mars? This is true. Like? There's no filter in here. I've got the uh, color. Is the color video camera we're looking through here? This is not a computer image. I've got it ported to my computer so I can stream it out, but it's basically like a TV camera that's on here. And uh, I always tell people when I'm pointing out Mars in the sky that Mars is the peach planet. It's not the red planet. If they're expect <laughs> you're expecting a stoplight when you look up, it's not, uh, it's not gonna be like that. But again, as you say, he's the God of war and he can't be peach. So um, it, <laughs> uh, we always call it the red planet. It's, 
it's never is or never will be uh, a bright red color. This is the natural color of Mars. Mars is uh, kind of a clay colored with rust added. So, so uh, um, actually, sometimes it's a little brighter uh, colored and a little bit more yellow tinged. Uh, the last opposition, there were a lot of dust storms. And the dust that kicks up on Mars tends to be a little more yellow. So uh, it covers the. Uh, the darker areas, so you lose those subtle details of those that, that exposed rock, but um, the planet will get actually more yellow than, than uh, peach colored at those times. But fortunately, in this opposition, the dust storms have been kicked up, and so uh, we're still seeing surface details pretty well. So just so everybody knows, we are seeing Mars right now. Um, it is from the Naperville Astronomical Association's Observatory in Naperville, Illinois. Um, we have Drew Carhart from the Naperville Astronomical Association there. Um, the, the association has the best of both worlds. You've got the, uh, a, a video observatory and uh, an, a, an observatory you can get your eyeball up to. Is that right? When, uh, in non-pandemic in non, in non -pandemic times, of course. Mm -hmm. But you all have been doing some online programs of your own, too. Is that right? We have been quite a bit. We've been trying to adapt, and uh, we, our, our group, um, we're amateur astronomers. We share an interest in some aspect of astronomy. A lot of us like stargazing, but some people might be more interested in uh, history or just the scientific parts of astronomy or um, the craftsmanship of building telescopes and things. So we try to foster all of that. But we've always been. We're we're in our 48th year, I guess now. Uh, we've always been very heavy on public outreach. So our observatories are on the south end of the city of Naperville. They used to be miles out of town, but Naperville came down and grew, grew to <laughs> surround the area here. But um, yes, we do a lot of public uh, viewing all year round in a normal year. And um, we hope we get back to that before terribly long. But again, yeah, we've moved online. This, uh, for instance, this Friday, we'll be doing a live stream where we show some of what we call deep sky objects, things beyond the solar system. So you get out to the stars and the gas clouds and the star forming regions, and then to whole galaxies beyond ours. And so we'll be imaging some of those things cool. from our other building. <laughs> Well, Mars is shimmering around. It's it's looking like it's on fire, but it's it's really not. It's it's uh, these. This is what you get when you look at Mars through a telescope. And but we do have some pictures that we want to show because I know okay. at least one of the people who took one of these pictures is on the chat right now, or at least he well, was a little while ago. So I'm going to show. There we go. I'm going to show Drew. We're going to come back to you in just a bit. Um, sure. I'm going to show these pictures. Then we'll go and see what uh, Commander uh, Clickar is looking at. We like to call him Frank. And um, we're going to show these pictures. And so we've got a couple of questions. Oh, yeah, go for about it. The specifications of the telescope, as well as the equipment used for this for the feed. So I think the telescope and the camera. So okay. Drew, why don't you can you talk about the equipment and then I can show the pictures while you're doing that? Sure. I wish I had come equipped with the photos to share in the daytime. Um, so the telescope is a uh, Newtonian reflector. It's actually, uh, so we have two observatories. Really everything in both our buildings is homemade. So um, this uh, is a 16 inch diameter mirror that was ground by one of our members. Um, it's, uh, it's in a pretty much entirely home design, very specialized mount. It was the biggest thing we could, I could design to fit in this rather small observatory we have. So. Uh, um, pretty standard telescope and uh, again, a Newtonian reflector. The camera that I'm using right now is actually a camera of mine that um, I use for on a microscope. And when we again started to adapt to this uh, streaming things, I thought, well, this will be good for planetary and it can talk to my tablet so I can stream out from there. So uh, um, it's... Uh, Again, it's a closed circuit TV camera, basically. It's not an astronomical imaging thing where you're gathering uh, frames to process or gathering a digital image to process more. So uh, um, it's, again, it's for live viewing of uh, something through an eyepiece. Again, it was a microscope camera, but different adapter, it became a telescope camera. So. Cool. Well, again, while you've been talking, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, while you've been talking, yeah, I've been showing uh, some 
really just incredible images of Mars. All of these pictures were taken by amateurs. Um, these are these are folks. I'm going to go back through the pictures, and uh, but these are people who just have an amazing interest. And some of these telescopes are relatively small. Um, some are a little larger. I know the picture, the, the telescope that took this particular one, I believe is an eight inch telescope. Um, so that means the main mirror is eight inches across. Uh, but the person taking it has a lot of skill with that telescope and the camera. So um, this, has, this is probably uh, just one of the most amazing set of pictures from our local community uh, of Mars. It's just, it's just incredible. So I hope you guys are enjoying all of these as I'm going backwards in time through these pictures. Um, I'll get back to the beginning. Um, so I know one of the people who took uh, one of the pictures is uh, is on the chat. So uh, Ron Masters, I know you're out there. So uh, saying hi to you. This is your picture that you took two months ago. Um, and so he kindly provided all the information that's up on the screen. Um, so anyway, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed seeing these pictures. And yes, you have to do an awful lot in, to the pictures in order to, to get them to look like this. Um, and so the image through the uh, telescope is, is uh, it, it's pretty cool. Um, and then the images that you can get out of it are also pretty cool. But now we want to go to Frank. Hi, Frank, how you doing? Good evening, Michelle and Adriana. Welcome to Mega Mark Observatory. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. You wanna take us on a little tour? What's going on out at Mega Mark Observatory? Well, I'm in the control room of the observatory. I'm monitoring three different uh, video screens here being run by two computers. Uh, one of the computers is actually running the telescope, and the other two is running well, our little meeting here, as well as the cameras that I'm operating. Um, I'll, I can't show you the telescope live because it's dark in there, obviously. However, I do have a picture <laughs> I took uh, earlier today, and this is the instrument that we are using. And uh, this cool. is a the biggest telescope, the big white one you see here, is a 20 centimeter Ritchie Chrétien astrograph. And there's a 132 millimeter refractor and a 90 millimeter refractor as well. Um, the telescopes can be switched in and out to, to be replaced by a, a specialized instruments such as a solar telescope, for example. And the mounting on which they're situated is being operated by me here in the computer room which is very nice on a cold winter night because I can sit here comfortably and take a look. I don't actually look through the telescope, of course. I look at my video screen, which is you know, much, much easier. Now, as you know, although we're, we are discussing Mars tonight, there are a couple of other planets out there, which you mentioned. And I have the astrograph aimed at one of them. And here we are. And I'll zoom in. Oh, that is our friend Jupiter. That is Jupiter. And I'll uh, let's center it a bit here for you. There we go. Now, again, the, the seeing is not that great this evening, obviously. Jupiter, though, if you go out and look at Mars and you head look south at Jupiter, uh, it's not quite as bright as Mars, but certainly the brightest thing in that part of the sky. Now, if you look very carefully, and the video image is eh, but you will see two pale dark stripes crossing Jupiter. Uh, now, Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system, uh, mainly a big ball of hydrogen gas, actually. But these belts are actually what would be comparable to jet streams here on Earth. So you are looking at the weather on Jupiter. And very cool. You you can't really see that well. However, and I will, I'm going to switch to another picture here. This is a picture I took just the other day, which shows you what Jupiter would look like if you had a nice steady evening. And this is taken through special filters as well. And you can see those belts of uh, clouds quite clearly here as well. And actually, you can see Jupiter, even through a small telescope, you can see the belts. And you should easily see the four moons, the four brightest moons around Jupiter, um, which Galileo discovered 400 years ago. I think right now, now, OK, maybe Adriana knows, how many moons does Jupiter have now? It used to be 12 when I was a kid. 79, I believe. 79, yeah. 
Yeah, it, there, a lot. It has a lot. <laughs> no, that's and last time I checked. Yep, yep. Now, Frank, you and Drew both used a term, seeing. Um, if you could tell our, our audience um, in, in general terms, what does seeing mean? What does that mean to an amateur well, astronomer? Seeing, you can see how bad the seeing is here tonight by looking at Jupiter. Seeing is a term that astronomers use to describe the steadiness of the atmosphere. It has nothing to do how clear the atmosphere is. In fact, it's a very clear night tonight. However, we've had some windy days in the Chicago area the last few days, and though that wind causes turbulence in the upper atmosphere. And this is an interesting point for those of you who think one be a bigger telescope would help. It does not. Actually, a smaller telescope will give you a somewhat sharper picture than a big telescope. And the reasons for that, well, it's a little complicated, but the little bubbles of air, which the light passes through, have to go through more bubbles to fill the, the mirror of a big telescope and fewer bubbles to go th to fill a small telescope. So the small telescope has a clear view. Now I say this is a 20 centimeter or a 10 inch telescope, which is about mid range. And uh, I actually will get a better view through the 132 millimeter refractor, but the image would be much smaller as well. So we'll stick with the, with, the, with the 10 inch here tonight. I wish I could show you the moons, the video camera I'm using. In fact, people will ask uh, what type of video camera am I using here? I'm actually using my digital single lens reflex. This was the best camera I could find to give me an image that was sufficiently clear and bright. My other astro cameras require longer exposures and they have a rather shaky image because they only go at about 15 frames per second. And regular video is anywhere between 30 to 50, 60 frames per second. And so with these other cameras, the image would look very choppy and jerky. I wanted it smooth. That's cool. And I, I actually, I can, I can see on the image and I'm looking at another screen above me. So if, if people are looking like you're not looking at my camera, what's going on? I'm looking up here. I can see a, a moon to the left of Jupiter in your image. So I, will zoom out. Is that a little oh, better? I think I can see another one to the right. Yes. I yeah. can't see it on my monitor because the light is on here in my control room but I didn't notice them on the monitor inside the observatory dome itself. Yes, those are two, uh, two of Jupiter's four bright moons. Yep. They're, I, I'm not sure I didn't check which ones they are, but they're, they have to be either Io, Europa, Ganymede, or Callisto. Right, right. I think I see one, there's one a little farther away on the right and one kind of in between um, on the right are. as well. And I'm going to look up uh, which moons those are. So give me just a second. Okay. And while we're doing that, um, so Frank, I mean, I realize we're talking about Mars. We, we showed Jupiter. You got to admit, what does everybody want to see when they look through a telescope? Everybody wants some Saturn. Can we show these yes. folks Saturn? All right. In fact, I will leave the video camera active and you'll see Jupiter suddenly disappear and something else should appear. And my, my cat just showed up properly. <laughs> I will say execute. Yes. Zoom and bingo. There it is. Oh, there it is. There it is. By the way, uh, the the moon on the right, the far right was Ganymede. The moon to Ganymede's left was Europa. The moon on the left side of Jupiter was Eo. So okay. there you go. But we have Saturn. Look at that. You can see some Now, again, too. you can see the seeing here is really bad. Um, I think the re Jupiter, I, I live next to a small lake, and uh, Jupiter is right over that lake. And the humidity rising from the water has a tendency to stabilize the image. Although Saturn's pretty close to Jupiter, it's over a house about 150 feet away, and it's probably suffering from the heat radiation coming off the roof of that house. But you can certainly see that Saturn has a ring. In fact, uh, the interesting thing about the ring, uh, people think it's maybe a huge, you know, thick mass of rocks and what have you. Well, the ring is pretty big. It's about, uh, uh, I think it's about 150,000 miles across from one side to the other. 
But what really was a surprise to me, and I only discovered this a couple of years ago, the ring varies in thickness. Remember, it's 150,000 miles wide. It varies in thickness from 30 feet to half a mile. It's, wow. uh, it's razor, razor thin, made of uh, mainly ice and some rock and dust. And uh, every 15 years, due to the orbital movement of both the Earth and Saturn, the ring appears edgewise to us and it virtually disappears. You can't see it. I mean, how can you see something that is, in this case, a billion miles away that's 30 feet thick? Well, you really can't do well although the Hubble could probably do it. Now, what does Saturn really look like? Let me, again, give you a picture I took just the other day. There is, Ooh. again, the seeing wasn't that great that day either. But as you can see, Saturn does have some belts like Jupiter, not as, not as pro uh, pronounced. And you can also see that there's a split in the ring here. And there are actually more than just one ring around Saturn. There's actually dozens. Uh, there are about, I think there are 12 main rings and each of those is split up into several hundred other little tiny rings, all separated by little gaps. Some of them are maybe two or 300 miles wide. Some are only a couple, couple of hundred feet wide. But one, one interesting thing, if you look at the top of Saturn, you notice the ring sort of disappears there. That's the shadow of Saturn on the ring. Uh, it gets to a point in its orbit relative to what we see from on Earth that the, the planet itself will cast a shadow on the ring. Now, it's, uh, the ring is almost at its most exposed angle right now. Uh, it'll slowly start closing up in the next few years. I think about 10 or, 10 or 12 years from now, it'll be edge on, but from right now, if you have a small telescope, you can see the ring, absolutely. Uh, even a small telescope will show you the ring. You won't see the split in the ring, uh, but you'll have a better telescope, I'm sure, than Galileo, who first looked at Saturn and thought it was a planet with handles. Absolutely, yeah, with handles or ears. Um, just like if, if you see a, a, a mug with a handle from far away, he wasn't quite sure what he was looking at. Um, that's really, really cool. Um, and... Yeah, look at that thing just jump around so much. It's 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 amazing that when you look at it with your eye, you can see this this shimmering as well. Um, so yeah, the 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 planets, even though it just because it's clear out, it doesn't necessarily mean it's perfect for actually looking at something in the sky through a telescope. So um, the thing, when you do observe a, a planet or actually anything, uh, the moon, the planets particularly though. The longer you look at it, the more you see. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever we have uh, public events at the Naperville Astronomical Association, we go out, you know, hopefully again next year, next summer, we'll have that again. Uh, I tell people, don't just take a quick look and, oh yeah, there's Saturn, fine, but then they leave. The longer you look at it, the more you will see. Your eye has to be trained to look for things. And I say, stay there for a minute. I don't care if there's a few people waiting, stay at least a minute and study it, stare at it. And all these little details start popping out. Uh, this is true for the planets, certainly true for Mars this year and yeah. the moon as well. Um, even with a, a relatively small telescope like I have, which is you know, 10 inch, um, I can see craters only a mile in diameter on the moon if it's a steady night and I study it carefully. So That's cool. Well, you sound just like astronomy educators and, and astronomers and folks at the Adler Planetarium because we love for people to notice details as well and to really observe. Um, and so we want to observe Mars one more time uh, before we end for tonight. So we're going to go back to Drew and uh, see what he's looking at and see if the seeing has gotten any better. Probably not, <laughs> but um, oh well. Still got a good color. A tiny That's, bit. Yeah, a little tiny bit. Tiny bit. So, yeah. so uh, while we are taking a look at Mars, can we take some of our Mars questions here? Sure, go for it. Because I've got a fun one. Have, have Mars and Earth ever collided? Thankfully, no. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so cool, though. I mean, not cool for us. But. However, 
excellent question because where did our moon come from? Potentially an object the size of Mars collided with the early Earth. Um, and and the, the, the stuff that splashed out from that collision, plus possibly some of that original body, formed our moon. Um, and so that is uh, one of the main ideas for where we got our moon from. So not the actual planet Mars, but possibly something the size of Mars collided with the very early Earth. So there you go. But I'm hey, Drew, I'm there for it. Yeah, I'm seeing more uh, more surface detail there. Um, oh, that's cool. And uh, and so Adriana, do we have more questions? That was a good one. They're yeah, all good so questions. We've got one more time. Where and when is a prime time or place to view Mars? Um, a great time to view Mars is now. Uh, so if you look in your eastern skies, it's going to look like an orangish star-like dot. It's going to be pretty bright in the sky. It'll be getting a little bit higher in the sky over the course of the night. So if you have buildings or something in the way to your east, like I do, give it a little bit of time. Wait for it to maybe rise above the buildings or trees that might be blocking your view. Yep. And later this month, it's going to be rising uh, in the sky. It'll be up higher at sunset uh, when it gets dark enough to see it. Each Good night, point. it'll be a little higher and a little higher. Um, so even though it won't be quite as bright at the end of the month, near the end of the month, it'll be even higher after it gets dark than it is now. So that will make it a little, a little easier for you to see. So, all right. Any more questions? Let's see. Do you if, think uh, I could, if I can interrupt for just a yes, second, please. If, yep, if, go ahead, Drew. If, if the image gets dimmer at moments, we've got a rather notable patch of really high clouds that are kind of heading toward Mars right now. And so no I think kidding. Of dimmed, course they are. <laughs> when, it, yeah, when, it, when it dimmed down a minute or two ago slightly, yeah. that was yeah. a thin cloud going in front of it. And uh, that might happen again. So yeah. <laughs> just Interesting. a quick because. You're viewing live again, so we yep. put up with the weather a lot. And doing yes, this. yes, we do. And that's the thing that everybody has to understand, that um, whatever happens, happens. And whatever the universe gives you is what you get. And what right. you learn in amateur astronomy or any astronomy is patience. Yep. <laughs> Oodles of patience. <laughs> you learn so. why they uh, put a telescope out in space, where there's no atmosphere making it blurry and no weather to get in the way. And also exactly. why they put observatories on mountaintops. To, exactly uh, on in, tops in of very mountains. dry places so, yep uh, and exactly dry places you don't want to put a telescope in the middle of say the rainforest in panama you want to put your telescope on top of a big tall mountain or hopefully extinct volcano um and try to get above as much of that air but your astronomers and your telescope operators still need to breathe so we can't well there was a, there was a period um in the uh 1800s when the largest telescope on the planet, there's the cloud right there dimming it down. Yep. Uh, when the largest telescope on the planet was in Ireland and they had four or five good nights a year that they could observe because it rained yep. there all the time. So. Yep. And at one point the largest, well, still is the largest refractor, the largest lens telescope is in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. Not exactly known for its clear dry weather all year long, but anyway. Um, Interesting. You can totally see when those clouds go past, but you yes, still, we could still see um, the dark markings um, on the uh, on, the, on the surface of the planet. The clouds actually seem to improve the contrast a bit because it, it dimmed the image. I'm looking a at the monitor, and uh, uh, yeah, right there. I mean, you can actually see some more detail than a little <laughs> bit. Yeah, I, I yeah. can actually do that too on the camera by adjusting the brightness. Um, I can do rude things but there's a pretty heavy cloud right there so um, yep. yeah so I can do that if we want to blow my <laughs> so oh my I sort of had it I sort of had it adjusted <laughs> for seeing it but the clouds are coming and going so it's hard to, but again you see that stripe kind of through the middle of the planet sure can that's yep. uh those are those dark markings on the planet and if you if you since it's adjusting the cloud is adjusting the contrast one of the last things that you see on the left side at about 11 o'clock it's a little bit brighter splotch we've got an ice cap there right up there um, yep. so yeah and so it can it it 
it, it at least makes itself known a little bit more. So those of you, if you are having trouble seeing that out there on screen, it's okay. We're all having trouble seeing it. So it's not just you, um, but it is something that once you know what to look for, dark markings, slightly brighter colors, um, then you can start to pick out a little bit of detail on the planet. So cool stuff. All right. Well, I've had a lot of fun. I don't know about yeah. anybody else. We have the best of both worlds here. We have uh, Mars through one telescope. We've got Jupiter and Saturn through another telescope. We've got pictures taken. Um, actually, it's three worlds. Pictures taken by amateur astronomers in the Chicagoland area, all celebrating uh, the close approach of Mars today. And Mars opposition, which is um, Mars at opposition, which is next Tuesday. So we're going to do this show again um, next Tuesday at 8 p.m. And um, if it's clear again, we're going to show live images of Mars and Jupiter and Saturn again. Um, and we'll see what the sky looks like next week. If it's cloudy, we're still going to be on with um, Frank and Drew. We're just going to show some images that people have taken and uh, and enjoy Mars some more. So, um, so we are going to start to wrap up for tonight. Um, uh, Drew, any last words you wanted to say to our audience before we end? Well, I guess a good place to be would just to say how much fun it can be looking up at the sky and you don't I, it's uh, Michelle has made the point a couple times and I'll be on it too that, that um, you don't have to have any equipment to go out and look up at the sky um, if you want to see Mars you can see that from downtown Chicago because um, it's so bright there are things you can see from anywhere you don't need equipment if you have a pair of binoculars, you can take them out in a little bit darker place or look out over the lake and see things. So um, look up, it's it's really interesting. There's a whole universe out there. Um, we tend to get really uh, involved in our earthly lives and, uh, and what's going on in day to day, but you can just turn your head up and see an entire universe by looking out. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I know the Adler is looking forward to continuing sharing with you and groups like ours are, are doing the same thing. And uh, yep. um, we like sharing it because we really get a lot of enjoyment out of looking at the universe ourselves. Yeah, I totally agree. I've, I've enjoyed it ever since I was a little kid. And I know that the Naperville Astronomical Association came out of the Astronomy Club at, uh, at one of the high schools in Naperville. And so you guys have been enjoying this passion since you guys were young. And uh, you continue to do that with a, a big huge group of people in the Naperville area when it's non-pandemic times you have telescopes out on the Naperville Riverwalk you've got viewing nights at your observatories it's it's just really great what you do for the public and so we love sharing our clubhouse in the Chicago area with everybody and so um, Frank any last words you wanted to say as you were showing us Jupiter and Saturn anything you wanted to share with our uh, with our audience out there well indeed again as Drew said you really need Need, you do not need any equipment to really appreciate the sky. But of course, we always get asked, well, gee, what type of telescope should I buy? And um, actually, one of the best things you can start with is a good pair of binoculars. You'd be amazed what you can see with binoculars. Well, first of all, you can see the moons of Jupiter, no problem at all. Rings of Saturn, no. But you can certainly see numerous star clusters and nebula um, with a, a simple pair of maybe, well, 750s would be good. 750 binoculars would be the best. But even a smaller pair, they work wonders in enabling you to see things you cannot see with the naked eye. And it's a relatively inexpensive investment unless you want to spend a lot of money, but you don't have to. Uh, enjoying the sky is... Uh, is really just appreciating what's up there, looking at it, thinking you're looking back in time. I mean, look at this image of Saturn I have on my screen now. Uh, that's about, let's see, I should, I should have done the math, but that's over an hour away. The light you are seeing took an hour at least to get from Saturn to Earth. So that's not the way Saturn looks now. That's the way it looked an hour ago. <laughs> and if you look at something like the North Star, the light that's arriving tonight left when 
Columbus set sail for the New World on the first <laughs> trip, it's 500 light years away. And so you're looking at light 500 years old. Wow. So you look at the sky, you're looking at a time machine. You're looking back in time. That's amazing. And and thank you for that sentiment that uh, it, it does not take more than just your eyes to look up. And if you want to uh, join us again next week at 8 p.m. Um, we would love to, 8 p.m. Central, that is. We'd love to um, uh, show you Mars again. And uh, just to add on to what Frank said, our October 26th show is called Binoculars and Books and Apps. Oh, my. So if you want to learn about binoculars and books and phone apps that we like to use, um, we're going to show you a bit about that. So um, that's a great lead into that show. That's Monday, October 26th at 7 p.m. Central Time. We're back on our normal date and time for that. So, um, Adriana, any last minute questions, comments that we want to get? I know we've had over 800 viewers on tonight um, during the show. So we thank Very all cool. of you for coming on tonight. Um, any last minute uh, questions? I think Lucianne has done a great job of helping answer our guest questions. That um, is awesome. So most of them I think have already been answered. Thank That's you great. so much, Lucianne, for your help. And also thank you to our friends from the Naperville Astronomical Association for giving us these exciting views tonight. It's been, it's been really cool. It has, and we hope you've enjoyed it. And hey, everyone, we wanna know, how did we do? Um, we'd love to get some feedback from you. We're new to this. This is these are these are shows that we are producing uh, at home while the other is closed. We would love to improve, and so the only way that we can do that is uh, if we know what you think. And so we're going to put a link to a feedback survey that you can answer just a few clicks. It would take just a few seconds to fill it out. Um, if you wouldn't mind doing that, it would help us make our shows even better because we want to come to you every few weeks and give you some really practical information. So. Um, I know I mentioned this before I took I took Adriana's thunder but um, our next show is next Tuesday, October 13th at 8pm Central Time and we will have even more Mars Adriana do you want to tell these people how they can keep in touch with us afterwards. I would love to. <laughs> so if you want to share any images or observations that you make of Mars, please do so using our social media channels. We are at Adler Planet on Twitter um, and Instagram, and we are Adler Planetarium on Facebook. Uh, and please use the hashtag look up. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. And if you take any pictures of Mars, either you've taken them the last few days or you take any between now and next Tuesday, we want your pictures. I want to feature some of your pictures at next week's show. We got some from our local astronomy community. We want to get them from our Sky Observers Hangout community. So send us your, your camera shots of, the, of Mars in the sky. If you have pictures that you've taken through a telescope, pictures that a family member or friend has taken, we would love to get your picture. Just send it to us with the information to give you proper credit on the screen. We would love to do that. And we really mean it. Please send us that and use the hashtag look up all one word look up thank you so much everyone frank thank you drew thank you this was so much fun lucy ann thank you colleen thank you sky observers hangout family thank you we will be with you next week and thanks a lot everyone have a great night have a good night oh,